Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. So I'm Isabel, Isabel dos Santos. It's really nice to meet you, and uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. I have to say it's my first um, conference with uh, students, and it's, I'm very, very happy to be here because most of you are fellow Africans like myself, and most of all, you are very, very talented uh, from, where, from whatever part of the world you're from. So if you're here, it's because you're talented and you care and you're passionate about what you do. And I think already we have that in common. So it's a real pleasure to meet you. So I'm not going to talk about serious stuff today. Okay, so uh, no trading issues or IMF or uh, any, you know, very hot topics, I hope. But um, before I start, what I really wanted is to learn a little bit more about yourselves and um, also to learn from you. So if you allow me, I'll just ask a few questions first. Um, so I see that we have a lot of Africans. How many Africans do we have in the room? Do you mind raising your hands? <laughs> OK. That's good. Very good. And um, okay. it, was a bit like, it was a bit like, who is Spartacus? Right, OK. I'm Spartacus. <laughs> and then uh, my next question is, um, uh, who, who wants to do business when, when they um, move on to the next life? Who's going to be a business or entrepreneur? Okay, wow. A lot of private initiative. Good. Very good. And uh, who wants to go into, into politics when uh, they leave? Ooh. So, so it's going to be a hot debate then. <laughs> okay. So I guess for most of you, this is a, a really important moment of your lives because until now, you kind of knew what you were doing. You, you went to school and... Um, then you knew what university you wanted to try and attend to, and you made it, you're here, you are graduating, or you have graduated and doing further studies. And for some of you, I guess the big question is, what are you going to do next, and where are you going to move from here? And that is a question that I get asked quite often um, by younger versions of myself, I believe. What am I going to do next, and what are the right choices? And it's a really, really difficult question to answer. I was talking to my niece and nephew the other day. I said, well, if you had to ask me anything, um, what would you ask? And that's exactly what I, they asked me is, what should I do next? It's very, very hard to tell someone what is the next thing in their lives. Um, it's, um, it's a very personal choice. So my advice is, whatever you do, you have to have a plan. You really have to have a vision for yourself of, of a plan forward. And when you have this plan, one thing you must do is um, you must not forget yourself. You must not forget who you are. And the reason why I say that is because, unfortunately, as most of you will know, the world is still full of prejudice, and uh, it's not easy. So either you're too young to do something, or uh, then you're too smart and too privileged to be something else, or then you're a girl, so uh, you're the wrong gender. So there's always going to be something. But whatever it is, whatever obstacle is out there, you really mustn't lose focus of, of who you are. And, um, your identity. Your identity is key. So you have to believe in yourself um, to be able to fight all kinds of discrimination you'll find from here onwards and in your path forward on your professional lives. Another thing I really um, want to share with you is that key to success is really that you need to be driven by excellence. You need to be driven by your passions. Uh, Whatever you do, and it doesn't matter. Some people say oh, it's ridiculous. You want to become a, an artist, or people will say, well, you, know, you want to study geography. That makes no sense. I mean, what's geography useful for? Well, whatever it is that you study, or whatever it is that you want to work at, it really doesn't matter. As long as you're driven by excellence and your passion, I'm sure you will succeed. That's a, a very important lesson that I learned. And then you, you have to set it out. You really have to sort of plan it, set it out and then do it and persist. Along your way, many people will tell you that your ideas are ridiculous, that, oh, will never work, forget that. What do you want to do? Oh, nah. Well, the truth is, if it was that easy, uh, they would have done it. And if your ideas were so bad, well, then why do you believe in them? So remember, you believe in your ideas, and that's, uh, that's really what counts. So I know this topic is about Africa and built for Africa and African solutions. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, whenever I'm asked to talk about Africa, for me it's a little bit difficult because we are 44 nations, 
We're all different. It's 54. 54, that's what I said. <laughs> but thank you. You're never wrong. <laughs> yeah, we were checking that earlier. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, we're, we're all different. We have different languages. Uh, we have definitely different cultures. I'm being very well educated by my husband now on, on African culture and African masks and African art. So I realized really how little I knew before, before he actually introduced me to these um, issues about other African cultures. And we have different frameworks. We have different legal frameworks. We have different political systems. We have different um, economic policies. So I tried to kind of think just little teasers. I'm going to talk about three topics, and they're going to be very short, I hope. Little teasers that would, in a way, summarize some of the similar challenges we share. Because this is what, for me, is really important. As Africans, what are the similar challenges we have? And what are the lessons that we could share with each other and to improve from each other? In a way, not to only try and benchmark uh, Europe or uh, America as our references, but also to look at our own examples, things that we have done well in the continent, and use those as, um, as part of our solutions, the famous African solutions for African issues. So I'll start with the urban development. The reason why I chose this is because it's a personal, it's, it's a personal issue for me. It's a project that I was involved with uh, since 2009. Um, I became very aware that the city that I loved, that I was, that I was brought up in uh, since a little child, had changed tremendously. I remember being five and six years old and walking to school, and it was absolutely safe. There were very little cars. Uh, there were trees along the road. I could go to a park and play on my way to school. And that city had about one million people. Well, the same city today has seven million people, and it has changed tremendously. I'm no longer able to walk because it's too hot. There's no more trees left. And that park has been converted into um, a private um, event space for, for weddings. And the school that I went to no longer feels as large and, and, and spacious as it did. So what happened? So these are the kind of questions that I thought of thinking back in 2009. I was fortunate enough to be a, a leading consultant in a um, master plan project that was entitled the Luanda Master Plan. And the reason why I bring this experience to you today is because some of you might be politicians and uh, one day might be, sorry, in the decision-making uh, role. And when you do, it's, it's, it's very important to reflect on these ideas that I'd like to share. So today we have unplanned territories. I'm just going to ask for the next slide. Okay. Or do I have a button? Thank you. Oh, yeah. OK, so um, I brought you a little picture of Luanda. As you can see, Luanda in the background, that's uh, old town and new town. So the higher buildings are things that are being built now. But you see that there's a part of it that's quite structured and well organized. And then you see how we're starting to grow into urban sprawl and having this unplanned development. I'll put up a next picture as well. OK. Again, it's a picture of the structured city and the unplanned development. And I'll put the next one up. And this one is, is two pictures of two different African cities that are not Luanda, but that share the same problem. And I could say that this problem is probably common to Accra, Addis Abeba, Dar es Salaam, um, Cairo, Kinshasa. We, we all have this common problem. So when we look at that, what can we do? And this is where I feel that we have to have a plan, and we have to have a vision for the future. And this must, must really start now. The challenge with this is that to manage a territory where you have issues such as poor tax collection systems, poor waste management, uh, inadequate infrastructure, little access to education and health because of unplanned urban development, is going to be a massive challenge for any of you that one day wish to go into government. So this is something that we must address. But uh, again, to quote my husband, like he says, don't just show the problem, also show the solution. So I'd like to share with you a little bit of what we did. So with that background in mind, I'm going to talk specifically about Luanda, because obviously it's my city and is the one that I know best. Um, we looked at our town. And Luanda today has an area of about 
2,180 square kilometers. We are 6.5 million inhabitants now, but by 2030, we're going to be 13 million inhabitants. So our population will literally double in um, just under over 10 years. So currently we have about 16% of our land who's urban, 15 who's agricultural, but in, by 2030, about 30% 30 of our land will be urban, 24% will be agricultural, and only 46 will remain natural. To give you a shocking figure, today to travel in Rwanda takes about 190 minutes, and we hope that by 2030, if we start this plan now, it will only take about 19 minutes. So a significant change and a really <coughs> big difference. So what did we do? We looked at our town and how our town was sprawling. And we engaged with a number of stakeholders, everything from government to uh, local communities. We spoke to teachers, we spoke to students. We went out and spoke to local authorities, to women in the market, uh, to fishermen. And, and we, we tried to understand what was their vision, how, how do they think about where they want to live and where they want to bring up our children. And as somebody who's going to manage and be deciding politics and making political decisions, this engagement is truly important to really find out what is the right thing for your community. So we quickly looked and we saw that, okay, we have massive sprawl. So most cities in Africa have been planned around a traditional city center that was left from colonial days. And we now to need to think about creating new centers. So we went from a, a single city center to designing a multiple centers and then linking those centers with infrastructure, just as a road network, train network, and fast infrastructure so that you'd have connectivities. So as you can see, you will be migrating over the next 15 years from the first picture where you have a single center where everything happens and where everybody has to go to, and that makes that long, long traffic jams that we're all very familiar with, to rethinking our cities, allowing ourselves to create new centers, not only the old downtown, and evolving to the furthest picture on the back, where we have a multitude of town centers that could all have their own activity, their own administration, and still be very well interconnected. This would allow people to work closer to their homes, to live closer to where they work, for children, to see parents more often, because parents don't need to travel such long distances. So this is one of the solutions that um, we discussed and presented for the Luanda Master Plan. Okay, can I ask you for the next slide? Thank you. And you can see the other thing that we need, you need to think about. When I showed you that first picture, the houses were really just one story high. So what happens today is that governments need to invest a lot of money to build infrastructure that's very, very lengthy. Because for every single kilometer of infrastructure, you have one single dwelling that's just a small, short house. So one of the things that we must do in our towns, in our urban development, is also to mass the urban development. We need to get taller buildings. And why do we need to do that? Because government needs to generate more return for the infrastructure. Infrastructure is very expensive. Every time you build it, you have a maintenance cost, a yearly maintenance cost that's a percentage of how much it was cost to build. And the only way you're able to pay that is by taxes. So unless we all want to pay very high taxes, <laughs> then massing is very important because then we get everybody to pay very little and to share this great um, infrastructure. The next? Okay. So on the, on the story of uh, master planning and really rethinking our cities, I think the big lesson here is that what we really want to see is people who live in African cities to go from living in dwellings to living in homes and uh, from being people who are renting accommodation to becoming homeowners because we really need to build a, a nation of owner, homeowners uh, who are able to pass their houses on to their children with clearly defined property rights and in that way accumulate capital for the next generations. 
So not to share a completely different story, because I've decided to share three stories from my past today. Uh, this is um, a company that I founded about five years ago. Um, it took me a long time to get it right. It was very, very difficult. I knocked on a lot of doors to get funding. And not many people believed that that would be possible and that building such a project would be feasible in Africa. So we all live in African cities, and we've seen that we have these amazing street markets. And everything is sold in the street market, whether it's fruits, vegetables, spare parts. We have a lot of those. It's a challenge. It's an opportunity. But there is no doubt that today we could probably start thinking and addressing on how we could provide better employment opportunities and better income opportunities for all these people. So the story here is going from market to modern retail. And how do we make that evolution without leaving anyone behind? And the reason why I show the pictures of the first women is that even though we're migrating from market to modern retail, it does not mean that we must leave these people who are living and working in the market behind. We must integrate them and we must give them opportunities. So Candando is the name of the project means a hug, it means to embrace. So what we wanted in this project is really to be able to embrace the community and embrace it from two aspects. One, by giving opportunities, such as jobs, careers, new profession, training, and education. And here you can see some examples. So what we did is we built, before even we opened uh, our first retail store, way before, like a year beforehand, we built a school, and in this school we trained about a thousand candidates, uh, 600 of which then secured jobs and passed, and 400 that would be uh, enrolled for the next, for the next um, retail unit. So if I could just go back one. So as you can see, they go from practical lessons, from learning on basic skills on how to weigh goods, how to correctly price goods, to more complex issues such as how to then package them, how to use a barcode, how to then um, do stock counting, how to work with the computer to count the stocks. And it's a first step in their career. For most of these guys that you see in the picture, actually for all of them, it was their first job. They had never had had a job before. This was the first job they got. And so we trained them in, as you see in this side, this would be a career path in logistics and supply chain. So the person will learn how to go with goods from all the way from the supplier to the shop, to the stock room, and to distribution. On the other side, it's skills that are related with food handling, food packaging, and food processing. And this training package is about six months. And it's completely for free. You don't need to pay for it. Students don't pay for it. It's just about them showing that they have the merit, they have the talent, and most of all, that they are committed to really do this and, and to be engaged. Let's go to the next one. So I mentioned opportunities. So, oh, yes. I, and they also have practical lessons. So not only do they have lessons that are working with goods, but they actually have academic lessons where they learn everything from uh, IT skills to um, accounting skills to general basics of economics. Um, and, and behavioral issues. So the next opportunity that we set up in this project called Embrace, apart from young people, careers, training, professions, is giving opportunities for the local producers. You've mentioned um, trading, and should we allow imports, yes or no? It's always a big debate. And here, the reason why I bring this picture is, um, is local, pro lo local producers. This is an example of a strawberry farm. So this is a strawberry farm in Angola. I guess most of you didn't think that we could grow strawberries. <laughs> and this is a, a particularly interesting case. I, I really love this story because it's a simple story. And it's uh, sometimes an example that I give as a startup. This whole project costed about $60,000, about 40,000 pounds. And it started with three hectares of land. 
the land was cleared and the local women that uh, before were street sellers in the market were engaged to plant and prepare the land and plant little baby plants. And there's a, over 200 women that work there now. The, the, the farm has grown, has grown since. And it, uh, from the moment the idea started and the plants were put on earth all the way to the shelf, the whole life cycle of the project, anybody has a guess of how long it took? It's okay. Two years, one year, any other guesses? Six months, nine months? Well, the person who said six months is very close. It took about four months to do this, four months. So what I mean to say, it really does not take that long to create change. It's one idea, a lot of commitment, setting it out, doing it, and you will see the results a few months later. It's been a very successful product. It's actually very, very good strawberries. They're very sweet. I didn't bring any. So <laughs> I'm not sure if I would be allowed to fly in with the African strawberries, Angolan strawberries into the UK. <laughs> so, oh yes, and this is an example of, again, local producers. So we sponsor a um, fisherman village. There's a village of 300 fishermen. And on part of the Embrace project, what we did is that we delivered um, fishing nets. We helped them uh, with their boats, also with fuel and oil. And they have become a regular supplier of fresh fish to our retail store. And I have to say, the picture is not great, but we have one of the best and freshest fish stalls now uh, in Luanda. So we're very proudly selling Angolan produce. So comparatively, just to mention a little bit more about the story. When I was about your age, um, I think 70% of the products on the shelves in, in the Luanda supermarkets, in Angolan supermarkets, were imported. And today, 60% of all goods are actually locally produced. The reason why I say that is also so that you understand that Africa is changing very rapidly. We're producing a lot of things locally already. And what we really need to do is to create that internal demand to make sure that we're actually spending our money also inside our community with our own producers and get their products onto the shelves. So just to touch uh, on what's the next big thing, because sometimes people ask me, well, if you're going to do something, what else are you going to build? Are you going to build anything new? Well, I think not. Now I'm, I'm slightly committed with the public office, hopefully not for long. So, But um, if I wanted to talk a little bit about the next big thing, so we all heard about the big success stories in uh, um, sorry, Africa. We all heard about the telecom story. We all know that one. It's amazing. Wow, everybody in Africa has a mobile phone. Unbelievable. OK. <laughs> <laughs> so this is an example of the company that um, I was a founder of. Um, I started off as a, as a radio network. We were, we were initially actually selling walkie-talkies, and we built a walkie-talkie network. And then eventually it evolved, and uh, then we became a mobile cell provider. And this is some, some fun um, marketing that we do with our clients, keep it young and friendly. <laughs> Next one. And then, of course, you also saw that um, there has been a lot of development in the financial services. And that's something that I'm very pleased to see. There's more and more banks in Africa, and what's great is there are even banks that are not just working in one country, but are working in a multitude of, of African countries and really creating a true African banking network. Now, this, for me, is key, because to be honest, as an entrepreneur, I feel that Africa has been cut out from all the financial institutions. We're being cut out from the banking sector. We've been cut out from financing. We've been, we've been left out. There's a lot of discrimination. So I'm happy to see that. Um, ourselves, we have taken upon ourselves to build these banks. If you look at Nigeria, at Ghana, uh, you know, Angola, all of us have, have really truly modernized over the last 10 years banking services. Again, when I was your age, there was no ATMs. It was not such a thing. We didn't have those machines way back where we put money and took money off the wall. We do now, and we have them everywhere. And when I mean everywhere, I don't just, just mean in the city. I mean literally you are in the countryside and you will find a bank branch where you could put your little plastic card and take out the money. Or you can even pay with your 
plastic money as well, with your plastic card as well. And that's, that's a massive evolution. Um, there are millions of people with bank accounts now. There were only a few hundred thousand before. So this definitely shows that the next growth in our, is in Africa. The next growth is, is not in another continent. We are the fastest growing middle class economy in the world right now. And people should not underestimate that when they, when they think about our continent. So banking and telecom are done. So what's the next big thing? I think that the next big thing is definitely, I mean, the thing that you guys are probably going to be building, um, I think is going to be about energy. We still have a big energy deficit in the continent. And energy is key. And why? It's a major input for industry. If energy is too expensive, we cannot be competitive. People say that we're not competitive because we're not efficient, or we're lazy, or we don't know how to do things. Well, that's not true. Um, we need to have cheaper, better, more reliable sources of energy. And those take massive investments. Um, and it also takes individuals to go out there and get them done. So I'm happy to see that a few of you in the next few years will become energy champions in Africa. <laughs> And last but not least, and to link back a little bit with Candando, which again I repeat means embrace, I mentioned that there were small producers and small farmers. But if we look at Africa, we're probably the last continent where true agribusiness has not been developed. So we don't have very extensive food production like we can. We have very fertile soil. We have a lot of water in some countries. And this is a true great potential. It's one that really must not be undermined. Don't think it's too hard. Really don't. If you look at the big corporations today, and we know their names, a lot of them are based on food production and agriculture. And it's a true opportunity for us. As Africans, we could really be exporting that to the world, but at a fair price and under fair conditions. So I'm not going to uh, elongate myself much longer. I just uh, wanted to hear from you and share from you also your views. So thank you very much. Uh.